Now, from WYDC-TV, this is Big Fox News at 10. Thanks for watching Big Fox News. I'm Ann Emanuel. A Rochester teacher making international headlines tonight for what some say happened in a seventh grade social studies class. According to The Guardian newspaper, school officials are looking into accusations that a white teacher made his class of mostly black students pick seeds out of cotton and put on handcuffs during a lesson about slavery. Some parents are calling for the teacher to be fired. The teacher has been put on leave while the investigation is underway. An argument over a prize at Dave & Buster's turns into a violent stabbing in New York City. It happened Saturday night inside the Dave & Buster's Times Square location. Police say a 39-year-old man was stabbed in the chest after arguing with another man over a prize that fell off a shelf. Despite life-saving efforts, the victim died at a nearby hospital. The violent incident shocked patrons inside who say the family-friendly chain is supposed to be a safe place for kids. 41-year-old Jesse Armstrong was arrested and charged with murder for the stabbing. Health officials say the U.S. should prepare for another COVID surge across the South this summer as infection rates tick up. Jonathan Sari has more from Atlanta. It's happening again. Two new Omicron variants sweeping South Africa have been detected in the U.S. They're called BA4 and BA5, proving the mutations are not slowing down. And a South African study shows these new subvariants can dodge immunity from past COVID infections, meaning it's more important than ever to get those vaccine boosters. The fast spread of the subvariants prompting a former White House COVID coordinator to warn of a major new surge across the South South heading into the summer. Our rural counties have lack of adequate health care, lack of primary physicians, lack of individuals to counsel them about vaccines. Things are even worse in China, where the new surge is spreading to the capital, Beijing, causing widespread lockdowns there and putting a damper on Labor Day celebrations on Sunday, usually a major holiday throughout the country. Couldn't travel for Chinese New Year, couldn't travel for April. Obviously, this seems to be sort of what's happening around about every holiday. Meanwhile, back home, Moderna is reassuring a skeptical public that their shots for children under six, currently awaiting approval by the feds, are effective in preventing hospitalization, even though they only block about half of Omicron infections. It's really consistent with the adult data, which is very reassuring. As the numbers are going up again, parents are getting more nervous. The FDA's Independent Advisory Board is scheduled to meet in June to discuss giving Moderna's shots to younger kids. In Atlanta, Jonathan Seri, Fox News. Some Broadway theaters are updating their COVID-19 policies when it comes to showing proof of vaccination. The Broadway League announcing that while all 41 Broadway theaters are extending mask requirements through at least the end of this month, as of Sunday, many are no longer checking the theater goers vaccination status. The league is encouraging patrons to check out individual theater websites for additional information. In the last few months, several Broadway shows have had to cancel performances because of positive COVID-19 cases cropping up among cast members. Airbnb is changing its COVID refund policy. The short-term rental company will no longer offer refunds for COVID-related circumstances, including cases where a guest or host becomes sick. Starting May 31st, Airbnb hosts cancellation terms will apply as usual, though certain reservations made before that date may still be eligible for a refund if they qualify. Early in the pandemic, Airbnb extended its extenuating circumstances policy to cover risks related to COVID, allowing guests to cancel and receive a full refund. A bittersweet day for Ukrainian civilians who have been trapped inside a steel plant in Mariupol. President Zelensky says at least 100 people have been evacuated, although the exact number remains unknown, and many more remain behind. Griff Jenkins has more from Kyiv, Ukraine. Tearful reunions as hundreds of Ukrainians arrived in Zaporizhia on Monday after being evacuated from the Azovstal steel plant in the besieged city of Mariupol. It was a risk. It was a risk, but uh, they wanted to, uh, to get uh, from Mariupol. Hundreds of civilians and soldiers remain inside the plant, the last remaining stronghold of Ukrainian forces in the city. Dozens of elderly women and mothers with small children were able to flee 
some recalling their horrific experience as they were holed up inside bombs falling all around them. We survived something that, God forbid, happens to anyone else. We need some long therapy, us and the children too. As evacuees make their way out of Mariupol, the State Department is sending diplomats back into Ukraine, a move the acting ambassador says sends a strong message to Russia. You failed. Uh, Ukraine is still standing. The government is still functioning, and we're going back to Lviv first and then Kyiv to help the government. This comes as House Speaker Nancy Pelosi, the highest ranking American official to visit Ukraine, wraps up meetings in Ukraine and Poland to discuss the U.S.'s commitment to the war torn nation. America stands with Ukraine. We stand with Ukraine until victory is won. As part of that commitment, President Biden will travel to Alabama Tuesday, where he'll visit a Lockheed Martin facility that manufactures Javelin anti-tank missiles. In Kyiv, Ukraine, Griff Jenkins, Fox News. A district attorney in Georgia begins the process of picking a special grand jury to investigate allegations that former President Donald Trump interfered with Georgia's election process in 2020. The special grand jury will be tasked with investigating the case. Then they'll recommend to the Fulton County DA whether there is enough evidence for an indictment. At the heart of the investigation is the much talked about phone call between Trump and Georgia Secretary of State Brad Raffensperger. People in Andover, Kansas are assessing the damage left behind by a powerful tornado. Hundreds of buildings are destroyed. Will Nunley has more. The cleanup just beginning here in Andover, Kansas. On Friday, a tornado ravaged the region, carving a path of destruction nearly 13 miles long. The National Weather Service confirmed the twister was an EF3. Oh my gosh. For nearly half an hour, winds up to 165 miles per hour tore through the Wichita suburb, damaging more than 1,000 buildings. The strong gusts sending cars and structures hundreds of feet into the air. That could have been my last night with my kids and it makes you want to turn around and redo everything that you've ever messed up in life. Utility crews have restored power to nearly all of the 15,000 plus customers who lost electricity during the storm. But the structural damage left behind is extensive. Fire officials say it could take years for the town to recover. It's emotionally changing just to go through that experiment, that experience. You know, it's, it's one thing, it's one thing seeing it, but when you're in it, it's a it's, it's completely different. The storm left at least four people injured, including two firefighters. Three University of Oklahoma students were killed in a car crash Friday evening as they returned home from storm chasing in Kansas. Oklahoma State Patrol says it was raining heavily when their car hydroplaned. They were a huge part of my life. I, I spent the majority of, of my time here with them. And forecasters say parts of Kansas could see even more severe weather through the evening. In Andover, Kansas, Will Nunley, Fox Weather. Alyssa Triplett has your forecast after the break. And later, a virtual reality look at the impacts of climate change. Here's your local stock market update from Big Fox. Now, your Twin Tiers forecast from Big Fox. Well, the gray clouds rolled across the area and brought some light rain showers to the region and the rainy pattern is going to stick in place here over the next few days. Now we will get some quieter weather through the overnight falling into the 40s and could deal with some foggy conditions due to the calm winds uh, early tomorrow morning. So note that there might be some hazards on the roadways tomorrow morning with that reduced visibility. So remember with fog, low beams on, take it slow, give yourself a few extra minutes and maybe bring the kids to the bus stop so they make sure they get on there nice and safely. But overall, we'll drive 
dry out through about Tuesday morning. You're going to feel the moisture though within the atmosphere, which is going to be that rainfall that is going to be returning by Tuesday afternoon. Now again, looking at staying as a lighter matter, maybe a few isolated rumbles of thunder, but for the most part, it is just going to be some weak uh, instability that is going to be moving through the area from stronger storms to the south of the region. But then we will end off that rainfall on Wednesday, but turn to some cooler temperatures as we step into even the late week and weekend forecast. So rolling through what we'll see here again, that cloud cover is in store, some fog cover there, and then we'll start to push in that shower activity into the mid afternoon. Even some of those higher reflectivities could give us a rumble of thunder Tuesday night into Wednesday morning and some brief downpours. So know that that uh, shower activity lingers through at least Wednesday morning, maybe even extending into the early afternoon. So a wetter weather pattern is really continuing to set up and stay in place. Accumulation wise, we are looking at at least a quarter of an inch where we'll see some of those more moderate potentials of uh, maybe a, a brief downpour. So half an inch is a possible Westfield. They're showing that number. So know that there might be some changes there where those heavier showers do develop. Now, when we look at that forecast through Wednesday, there is going to be a cooling pattern. We'll at least reach about average due to the quieter start to the day. So we're looking at Tuesday to hit about 69 degrees. Average is about 67 for this time of the year. Bath even hitting about 68. But then we are going to be trending those temperatures downward for your Wednesday. High of about 64 degrees, so back below average. Morning lows hold to the 50s due to that cloud cover in place, so there will be some cooler mornings as we start to clear out those conditions. So across the area, everybody looking at the 60s, even a few 50s in store due to those showers staying in place for the first part of the day. Then we'll see some sunshine by when by Thursday, but temperatures stay below average through at least about Mother's Day. The good news is, is Mother's Day will start to be the turnaround that some warmer air will start to work its way in for that third or second week of May. So that's some good news there. However, looking at that pattern, they're down to 64. Some sunshine on Thursday gets us back up to about 69 degrees, but shower activity possible across southern portions of New York will return on Thursday and into Saturday. So that keeps those temperatures back below average. So a little bit of a roller coaster there to track. So light jacket and waterproof jacket at that will be wanted for much of this week. But Mother's Day is looking gorgeous. Sunshine 66 degrees and we keep that sunshine and that warming pattern as we head into that second week of May. A college that offers a degree in cannabis education hosts a showcase to educate the community about the cannabis industry. Lizette Nunez has the story from Brooklyn. Leaders of the marijuana industry came together in Crown Heights, Brooklyn. Staff at Medgar Evers College shut the streets down to host a cannabis showcase and educate the community of this industry. When you take away the stigma, you realize that this industry is a pioneering industry and it has a lot of opportunity for many people to jump from their economical bracket and really change their wealth. The college launched a minor degree in cannabis education last fall. Arlette Alexis is a student in the program. This semester we are doing cultivation and chemistry, the chemistry aspect of cannabis. Our classes range from anywhere from 20 to 25 at this time, and right now we are at 95% capacity for each class. This education program comes as just last week, New Jersey began recreational marijuana sales. And New York regulators recently approved the first round of marijuana growing licenses, awarding it to 52 hemp farmers. Leaders in the industry say the time to join and make some green from it is now. This is exactly where cannabis is going. They're looking for students with degrees. They're looking for students with certificates. Those who are coming with richness of experience. And this cannabis showcase is also meant to promote diversity in the industry. This as communities of color have been negatively impacted by old marijuana laws. We're a rich, diverse state and we want to make sure that our Latino community is represented, our, of course, our black community, our African American community, our Asian community, like it needs to be reflective of what we are as the Empire State. Some parents in Greensboro, North Carolina are upset over a club that wants to hold its meetings inside school buildings. It's called the Satan Club, and the parents want their children to have no part of it. Aaliyah Sims has more. It wouldn't be indoctrinated by the world, about 50 people gathered with signs in hand. World influencing the church. Some on bended knee along Normandy Street in Greensboro to pray. This is kind of a rallying point just for us to stand up and say that this type of thing, the Christians in Greensboro do not want into their schools. They don't want this club, 
the Satan Club to gather inside Joyner Elementary or any Guilford County school. Late last week, these flyers went to students. This is not the time for good men to do nothing. This is a time for us to stand up and let our voices be heard. We're not trying to endorse Satanism and we're not trying to cr uh, criticize other religious organizations. Our after school club focuses on critical thinking, scientific rationalism. The club was slated to get its start Friday, April 30th at Joyner Elementary School. The chief of staff at Guilford County School says the club is under review. We never put in a request to start a club where we don't have the volunteers or support to actually put one in place. And I think all of the clubs we put into place now came from a parent request within the school district. Change us, cleanse us. This is an issue that's not gonna go away. And there's other clubs already established in other states. And so hopefully this can encourage the churches there to just take a stand. Experts say greenhouse gas emissions are largely causing temperatures to skyrocket, creating more severe weather disasters and threatening communities. And while studying climate change might not be the most fun, a group of artists hope to use virtual reality to make learning about it and preventing it more engaging. Jackie Ibanez has a special look. While the effects of climate change can impact all of us, it's sometimes hard to imagine just how devastating they are unless you are experiencing them firsthand. That's why Creative Minds in New York City are launching a new virtual reality experience at the Arcadia Earth Museum to give folks an immersive way to learn about environmental destruction and how to prevent it. The intention is to inspire people to come and leveraging game and immersive uh, um, beauty to deliver a message. Visitors don special Microsoft headsets called HoloLenses and wander throughout a network of halls and rooms representing various ecosystems on our planet. With each glance, an opportunity for a hologram and lifelike animation to catch your eye and teach you a new fact. Officials at Arcadia Earth hope that by engaging your senses and making learning fun, it will inspire more people to want to combat climate change. I want to make sure that I'm one of those people that will stand by the fact that we try everything we can. Besides holograms, each room also features recycled waste, like plastic bags, fishing lines, and more, that artists transformed into sculptures and interactive objects. The experience will cost you just under 50 bucks if you're using the VR headset. Officials say a portion of the ticket sales will go towards planting mangrove trees, which scientists say store more carbon dioxide emissions than other trees. Chicago history is being auctioned. Signs and other items from businesses that go back as many as 100 years. Sally Shelsey has the story. There is, is so much incredible uh, memorabilia in here, and it's also iconic. Inside Chicago Joe's, there's no shortage of interesting pieces ready for auction. Whether you want Chicago history, wild decor, or just memories of this longtime North Center restaurant. They've been here so many years, birthday parties, anniversary parties, just fun times, and they're going to be able to bring memories home with them. Even the iconic sign out front will be auctioned off Saturday, along with the neon chop suey sign outside of Orange Garden Restaurant, also on Irving Park Road. That dates back 90 years. A few weeks later, the Dinkle sign will be auctioned off, raising money for charity after the century-old bakery closes on Lincoln Avenue. So who wants a 12-foot wide sign like this one? There are collectors out there, but also think man cave dwellers. A lot of people who collect antique cars like big signs next to their cars. Opening bid on the Chicago Joe's sign, $5,000. You have to pay to take it down and get it home. Another sign grabbing attention, this one that asked us to smile as we pass Chicago Joe's. It's memories like that that people just have fallen in love with over the years. We want to leave you with a smile. A family that lost its dog more than a decade ago gets its precious pup back thanks to some handy technology. Rex is back with its owner, Marzina Nazadlik, in Boston. Rex had been reported stolen 11 years ago after going on the loose, then was reportedly picked up and put in a car. Rex was a gift to help the family recover after Marzina's brother's death. Well, animal control officers and police in Massachusetts saw Rex loose and picked him up. 
A microchip helped reveal the original owners. Police say Rex had a great night being back home and had fun meeting kids. <laughs> From our whole team, thank you for joining us. We hope you have a great rest of your day.